I'll be introducing our first speaker now, who is Caroline Catchpole from the National Archives. Uh, Caroline is Digital Development Officer and she provides support for uh, and guidance for uh, archives on a number of digital topics, including cataloging and providing access to uh, collections via Discovery, which is, of course, the National Archives major platform for archival uh, descriptions, um, which contains uh, about three, three, 33 million records. To talk to you today about municipal collections, it's important to understand the context of where we've come from. In 1869, the Historic Manuscripts Commission was formed to document the location of records and papers in private hands, as opposed to those held at the public record office. The work of the commission raised awareness of the importance of privately owned material for a more complete picture of the nation's archival heritage and history. In 1945, HMC's activities were expanded and the National Register of Archives was launched. The register helped produce a more comprehensive census of the nation's archives with information about private collections initially fed in by voluntary local committees and then increasingly by the Imagine Network of Archive Services. In 1995, the NRA indexes were made available online. The indexes, split into person, family, business, organisation and diary, list where archival collections relating to the record creators can be found. They are available today for research and discovery. In the early 2000s, a network project called Access to Archives was launched and collaborated with archives across the country to put archive catalogues online. These sat on a separate website until 2015 when they were moved into Discovery, which then became a comprehensive search portal for UK archives, encompassing both the A2A catalogues and the NRA indexes. The NRA is an invaluable research resource, but not without its limitations. It has been curated over the last 66 years and builds on data collected up to 150 years ago. There are 52,403 people represented in the NRA as record creators, and over 47,000 of these, or 90%, are men. Similarly, in Wikipedia, rates of biographies of women are far below what they should be, with just 17% of the biographies about women in 2017. We can't begin to accurately tell the history of our nation through records that are so overwhelmingly male-dominated. We record titles in the NRA and use the term epithet to represent a person's profession or what they were best known for in their lifetime. A cursory glance at this data reveals how skewed the representation is in the NRA is towards elite white men, reinforcing a very narrow, biased view of the preceding centuries of UK history and creating archival silences. This background gives context to where we are today as we build upon the work performed by colleagues in the sector over the last 150 years. In 2017, Manager of Collections was launched, giving archives the ability for the first time control over their collections on discovery. NYC is a web-based application that allows archives to upload their own catalogues to discovery, enriching a platform that already hosts over 11 million records from UK archives. These records sit alongside those of the records of UK government included in TNA's catalogue. Crucially, manager collections break down barriers around inclusion and representation. In 2021, an archive's access to an online catalogue is not given. Out of, the, out of reach of many resource limited archives or those who are entirely volunteer led, lack of online representation can lead to these collections becoming hidden and missing from the historical narrative and not allowing these communities a chance to share and amplify their voice and their heritage. Manage Your Collections provides the platform and the tools for archives to make their collections accessible in a user-friendly way. Archives can catalogue their collections into an Excel template that is provided in the system and upload their collection in just three steps to a platform that reaches on average 20,000 users daily. Already, just a few years since the launch of NYC, we are seeing collections being added that are diversifying representation on discovery. And I just wanted to share a brief snapshot of some of them with you today. 
the Labour History Archive have recently added the catalogue of Peter Patchell, the human rights campaigner, as well as the catalogue for the support group, Lesbian and Gay Support the Minors. Similarly, we are also seeing a growing number of community archives and local history groups using NYC to put their collections information online for the first time. A2A made great first strides in putting online parish records held in local authority record offices, but with NYC providing a free platform to allow groups to describe in their own voice their collection, we can greatly expand local stories and histories of communities and allow for greater research in this area. Manage your collections and the National Register of Archives are inextricably linked. We use data about collections that are uploaded using NYC to add to the NRA indexes. The more diverse collections that are uploaded for discovery, the more we can diversify the NRA indexes and build a more representative picture of the people and the communities that have contributed so richly to our society and our history. If we give custodians of archives greater agency and the tools with, with which they can share their collections, we can create more authenticity and representation in the historical record. Thank you for listening today. And if you're listening and have collections featuring women in your archive or indeed the collections feature, featuring any diverse communities, then I invite you to contribute those collections to Discovery. And um, I'm available at the following email addresses and I'm also on Twitter. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Caroline. Um, excellent. Um, our second speaker is Charlotte Rouché. And Charlotte uh, is Professor Emerita of Digital Hellenic Studies at King's College London, and also an uh, honorary archivist for the Society for Libyan Studies. And there she helps build the tools to present the Society's archives online, and also uh, does work around identifiers for relevant materials and in other collections. So if I can invite Charlotte to... Um, share your slides thank you thank you very much excellent thank you thank you um libya is a place which is exemplifies different difficult access difficulty for people there difficult for us um joyce reynolds uh if you want a energetic female creator of archives worked there from 1947 to 2008 and published. In 2007, a team of us at King's College started thinking about how to take her material and make it available online, accessible in a way that books can never be. And the, the, we, took, we started with a book which we, she had already published in 1952 and turned this into an online resource uh, with which could be much, much richer and above all, far more accessible than random copies of the book had been. We were particularly interested in experimenting, and 2009 is a long time ago, with how to express locations of places. Uh, these are archaeological objects to be found in particular places. Um, we still had very primitive systems. Libya had made it very difficult to get hold of geodata because it was sensitive. It became more available through Google Earth, but to have a beautiful map and to identify locations on that map are two very different things, as we discovered. Toponyms in Libya are completely confusing, as you can see. There is no way that you can index a place under just one of these names, which themselves reflect the complex history of the country. And there are, that we, our first focus was just to try and build a, a, a database of places, both ones we could identify and ones we couldn't identify, but which we had in the record. And that I think is is really quite important to, to think about. When we went to Tripoli and presented this just before the fall of Gaddafi in 2010, Libyans 
were clearly absolutely thrilled by the accessibility that we had been able to create. Uh, we got a level of engagement immediately and people started sending us information. And we realized that the, the database of places could be useful in itself. And so we worked to put it on, make it pretty and put it online because it could also be used then to be an index to other archives. So you can have an index for a place with the geolocation, with the names, with its relationships, and with the entries from the Society for Libyan Studies archive that's now been added, and with links to other places. But what's very important is to emphasize what we don't know. For lots of these places, the coordinates that we have are still very unreliable. Um, it's just a few people standing in a desert with rather rickety in, in, equipment. And so we want that to be clear to people and we want people to know what the things are that we have not yet precisely identified. Um, and to, in that way, to encourage people to correct what we've got wrong. So working on this one individual collection, uh, this is Joyce who's just been uh, celebrated her 102nd birthday. Our work was driven by the nature of the data we had, but we, we want to get everything out there, including our mistakes. Thank you very much, Charlotte. That's amazing work, um, uh, really, really valuable work for the Libyan archive. I'm sure that there will be uh, questions about it um, later on. So the next speaker is Alexandra Lee. Alexandra is a PhD student in human computer interaction design, and she's co-supervised by City at the University of London and uh, the National Archives. And her PhD uh, is looking at how humanities researchers make use of the um, archival information in their own research. So, Alexandra, over to you. Today, I'll be looking at a specific part of my PhD project, which focuses on the research practices of humanities scholars and how users create knowledge from archival materials. One aspect of the findings I'm particularly interested in is how users are redistributing the archive through their research practices and the potential implications of this for the archive. So what do we think about when we consider the archive? We might begin with a traditional definition. The archives is a centralized repository where materials are securely stored and accessed. However, as we're all aware in a modern archive, materials may not necessarily be stored nor accessed from this single point. Another way we might consider archives is in terms of their practices. So following Tom Naismith's suggestion, we could consider the archive as any place where archiving occurs. While this usually stops at the point of access, I want to invite us to consider what might happen to our understanding of the archive if we broaden this to include the user's practices too. So Jeanette Bastian has discussed the scholarly archive as an essential knowledge space for researchers that extends well beyond the boundaries of the collecting institution. Building on this notion, I believe that users' personal research collections provide an opportunity to examine the link between archives and the scholarly archive. By comparing these practices with those of the archive, we can better understand how the archive is being used by researchers. Personal archives are increasingly important in humanities research. Existing research has shown that users are increasingly moving away from the archive, treating the archival visit as primarily data collection. For example, a recent survey of Canadian historians found that almost 40% took over 2,000 photographs over the course of an archival visit. Now, Trace and Kratika have proposed what we're seeing as two distinct modes of archival research in situ, where interpretation takes place primarily within the archive, and ex situ, where researchers capture large amounts of material, mostly through photography, for analysis elsewhere. Now in 2019, I conducted my own study of humanities scholars' research practices at the National Archives. This employed a combined interview observation method, interviewing participants as they engaged in a self-determined routine research task. 11 participants conducting humanities research took part and each interview took around an hour. So first I'll provide a bit of an overview of findings here before going into some illustrative quotes. So we found that scholars primarily reflected Trace and Kratikov's notion of ex situ research. Though some showed a combination of both ex situ and in situ methods, none worked entirely in situ. As such, among other practices, collecting was identified as a core practice for all participants. 
the majority also explicitly discussed building their own personal collections as part of their research process. The two primary information activities were identified as significant to collecting, capturing and organising. Now during both, participants sought to preserve aspects of the archival structure through selection and arrangement of materials. This varied between participants, suggesting that each had a unique conception of what was necessary to perform a particular reading of the archive. As recognised by participant 11, there's parts of information and parts of the document. So when I find the document, I just don't only take the one, I always like to take the context it's found within. So we see that she sees the complete record as providing context to the information she's interested in. Now this also scaled up to include the wider context of the archive and series, thus mirroring the structure of the archive in participants' collections. For example, participant six sought to preserve the archival arrangement during capture. By ordering files by reference number, it ensured that when she photographed the document, the images on her camera roll would retain the same grouping of series and file when she consulted them later. In a more complex example, participant seven combined both notes and images. She would write a brief description of the folder as a whole in a spreadsheet, also noting any especially important items. These would also be photographed and stored on the cloud. Now, as a more selective approach, we can see that this is really creating a hybrid between her own interests and the archival structure. So whether working in situ or ex situ, what emerged was the importance of having a fixed point to work from that generated a perceived archival meaning of the record. For participants with easy access to the archive, this could be the archive itself. But for those working further afield with limited time to visit the archive, their own personal collection of materials might function as this point. So as participant five summed it, I'm just assembling everything that's in the archive so we can access it all off site through our little photographs and yeah, make sense of it later. So this implies a separation between creating the collection and later stages of analysis. Now this was mirrored further among other participants who commented on later stages of the research process, such as participant 11, who noted, once I have all the documents and I know what's in each one, let's say I'm writing a specific part in my thesis. So then I would copy paste into a separate folder that's about that specifically. So notably, she retains the structure of the original collection for initial interpretation. And only once she knows what's in each one does she then move into a different arrangement that better supports her argument. So to summarise, all participants incorporated ex situ work seeking to take records away for later analysis. Now to do so, some built personal collections that sought to preserve some of the archival arrangement to support a notionally archival meaning. However, these practices varied significantly between individuals, suggesting that each held their own conception of what was necessary to perform an archival meaning elsewhere. So for some researchers, it seems that their personal collections of items are de facto becoming the archives. Though these users seek to retain some of the archival context, largely through preserving provenance and original order through arrangement, these are nonetheless highly personalised collections created to support a single interpretation of the archive. So what might be the implications of this for archives? Well, users working ex situ are at a distinct disadvantage as they do not have access to the full archival context. It also highlights the importance of archival context in the early stages of knowledge creation, as it's needed to support an archival meaning before users are confident applying this in their own work. This suggests that additional support is needed for these users beyond information acquisition. So additional tools or support would need to reflect users' existing practices, as studies have shown they're unlikely to adopt tools unless they reflect existing workflows. For example, tools such as Tropy that allow for arrangement and annotation of documents are capable of both supporting early contextualization in the archival arrangement, but also rearranging at a later stage in the user's project. So though the scholarly archive is a highly personalized and selective rendering of archives, it remains closer than we might think. Users seem to be building personal collections to facilitate sustained access to the archive to successfully interpret an archival meaning. Now more support is needed for these users as they are at disadvantage due to their distance from the archival context, which has proved central to knowledge creation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, that's really intriguing um, about uh, creating archives from archives. Um, so over to the next speaker, Brigitte Vezina. Um, Bridget is going to is director of policy, open culture, and glam at Creative Commons, um, which of course is the organisation behind the Creative Commons licenses, which have now become the standard for open access worldwide. So, um, Bridget, over to you. Thank you very much, Paula. Um, so I'll be trying to answer this question with you: Why open glam? And I hope that together we can look into the future of. Um, cultural uh, of open access to cultural heritage. Um, before going into the details, I just want to highlight the three key points of this presentation. First is that GLAMS, and that stands for galleries, libraries, archives, and museums, fulfill the invaluable mission of caring for our rich cultural heritage. 
and sharing that cultural heritage should be top priority. Now, digitized cultural heritage materials should be shared online in the broadest way possible, allowing the public not only to access, but also to use, reuse, and recreate cultural heritage. And through a Creative Commons Open Glam program, we support GLAMs in ensuring better sharing of cultural heritage. Um, why Open Glam? What are the benefits of Open Glam? Well, I think they can be summed up in three main uh, clusters. The first is that for uh, institutions that share their content, their collections openly, it helps them to gain visibility and relevance through increased digital exposure. It's also a way to bring entire collections to a very wide range of users from researchers, as we've seen, to, but also to learners uh, and also the general public on a global scale. And finally, it also encourages not a passive appreciation of cultural heritage, but innovative and creative engagements, interactions and new interpretations and, and the generation of new knowledge and narratives uh, around cultural heritage held in collections. However, many institutions face uh, barriers to open clam. Um, and here again, I think we can group them into three different categories. The first is that there is a very complex copyright system that often requires some expert knowledge to navigate. Um, how do you determine if a work is under copyright or if it's in the public domain? Uh, if it's in copyright, how do you clear the rights? Who are the right owners? Uh, and once it's made available, what uh, permissions do users need uh, to, to use that content? Um, second is that the glam sector is marked by uh, conservative policies, practices, and mindsets. Uh, often we'll see that there's, there's a fear of loss of control when collections are put online. Um, institutions might fear that they might be misused or that they might not have control over the narrative, over their objects, which they consider uh, their prerogative to have. Um, there's also a, a wariness about uh, potential commercial uses or even free writing uses of others um, taking advantage of the, the free content that to, that institutions make available. And finally, there are very real financial constraints uh, and some sometimes not always justified concerns. So in terms of constraints, well, the cost of digitization itself and the, the digital infrastructure management is uh, not insignificant. Um, but also there's sometimes a fear of loss of however meager revenue can be derived from traditional licensing. And this, there are many myths around there that we need to dispel. So Creative Commons offers the tools that will support Open Glam. And the two main ones are the public domain mark and the public domain dedication tool. These are uh, tools that uh, institution can attach to the digital images to indicate to any potential user uh, that these objects are in the public domain and therefore are free to use and reuse. And at Creative Commons, we are adamant that reproductions of public domain works should remain in the public domain. In other words, if it's in the public domain in analog form, it has to remain so in the digital world. There are some limits to Open Glam. It's not an absolute uh, concept. There might be materials that are culturally sensitive, uh, the knowledge or cultural heritage of indigenous peoples, uh, private or confidential uh, content or, or material that has been collected in colonization context must uh, obey different kinds of restrictions and open, uh, open glam might meet uh, its limit uh, when those concerns are, uh, are at stake. This is where the concept of better sharing comes into play, where it's not a sharing for its own sake. Um, if you want to learn more, I just gave you a very, very short overview. There are many ways to be engaged. So we uh, provide advice and guidance to GLAMs that want to open up. So tailored uh, advice to individual institutions. We also offer the CC certificate, which is an online course. There's one specifically designed for GLAM practitioners to learn about copyright, licensing, and the whole open GLAM uh, ethos. All the resources are freely available and licensed CC BY on our website. Uh, there's also an open GLAM platform, which is a place for uh, GLAM practitioners to come and share their 
their experiences, the, their challenges, and, and, and maybe brainstorm some solutions together. Um, we have an annual event called the Global Summit, and this is taking place in September this year. Uh, it's a great place to engage in discussions and debate. There's a track on Open Glam. If you have something to say, please don't hesitate. Uh, the deadline to submit a proposal is next Tuesday, so there's still quite some time to do so. And finally, we're in the middle of a major fundraising campaign. Uh, we're celebrating 20 years in 2021. And uh, I would invite you also to reach out to me if you're interested in that. Uh, here are my contact details and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bridget. Um, it's really interesting always to, to hear about the training opportunities and the sort of community getting together opportunities. Um, and our final speaker is Claire Newing, uh, also from the National Archives. Uh, Claire has been working on the UK government's web archives since 2009. And so she's going to talk to us about um, how the team changed the processes during COVID uh, and during the period that we hope will be like no other in the future. Claire. <laughs> The mission of the web archiving team at the National Archives is to capture, preserve and make accessible UK central government information published on the web. We've been doing this since 2003 and since 2008, we've aspired to capture all central government web resources at least twice each year. The resources we capture are available free of charge to anyone with access to the internet. From our homepage on the National Archives website, Users can browse or search our archive website and social media collections. They can also be accessed through Discovery, the National Archives catalogue. Our specialist contractors, MirrorWeb, undertake the technical side of the capture process and host the web archive and search functions. We also undertake additional snapshots to enhance our record of the UK government response to events we think will be of particular interest to future researchers. This involves taking more regular snapshots of websites or parts of websites in response to events. This includes the sudden and unpredictable, such as terrorist attacks and severe weather events, as well as events which we can plan for in advance, such as Brexit and the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. But no amount of prior experience could prepare us for what happened in 2020. This slide shows the single page of coronavirus advice on gov.uk on 29th of January, 2020. Around this time, we started collecting the page more regularly. We also started capturing a small number of pages on other sites. As the pages were small in size and in number, we were able to capture more frequently without interrupting our business as usual work. By 28th of March 2020, the UK was locked down and COVID-19 was affecting all aspects of daily life. Almost all government sites now contained information about COVID, which in many cases was being updated frequently. We recognised this would be of interest to future researchers, but could not capture it all using our normal processes. So we adopted a three-pronged approach. The first prong involved undertaking increased frequency, in-depth calls of key sites. We identified around 30 sites which were of key relevance to the collection, considered how often they were being updated, and decided how regularly to capture them. We also decided whether to capture them in full or specifically target a relevant section, which is really important because it takes over a month to capture the whole of gov.uk. Each month we review the list and make changes to call scope and frequency if needed. We also identified some sites which were important but were not being updated regularly. In order to save our resources, we monitor them using a tool called Visual Ping and then capture them when Visual Ping's alerted us to changes. Prong two involves undertaking frequent captures of interactive resources, such as the coronavirus dashboard. Interactive content is difficult to capture using traditional web archiving software, so we could not use our usual pipeline. Fortunately, we had been experimenting for several years with newer technology, which is more successful. We established a process whereby we capture the content in-house at the National Archives and transfer it to MirrorWeb, who integrate it with the public web archive. At first, we were capturing the content manually, which was very time consuming. But as the pandemic progressed, our technical team continued to experiment with different tools and have now established a semi-automated process. The research work was prioritised because of the COVID-19 collection, but will greatly help us with our business as usual work in future. 
Prong three involved undertaking broad crawls across the UK web state. The aim is to capture information about how government organisations are affected by COVID-19, for example, how departments were operating differently due to social distancing. In order to identify relevant pages, we use a tool to check the home pages of government sites to see whether they contain specific words or phrases. If a page contains a match, it's added to a list. We then ask Mirror Web to capture the URLs on that list to a depth of two links. The list of words and phrases is revised regularly, and we are running the broad crawls fortnightly at present. This slide shows some of the tools we use, our team and Mirror Web use as part of our three-pronged approach. Some are free, while some require a license or subscription to be purchased. We were very fortunate that we were able to obtain ad additional funds from our organisation due to the importance of the collection. We were also fortunate that the web archive is hosted in the cloud and almost all our tools are available online. This made the transition to remote working much more straightforward for us than for many other teams. And this diagram shows our established web archiving process. Quality assurance is a big part of our business as usual work. Usually QA checks are undertaken by MirrorWeb, then by our team, and MirrorWeb would be asked to fix problems before we check them again. For the COVID collection, we decided we would not ask MirrorWeb to undertake QA, and would not ask them to fix problems in each snapshot. Instead, we would make changes to the instructions sent with future snapshots to ensure the next capture was better quality. This was vital as it enables us to publish snapshots more quickly. We also capture some social media channels, we didn't need to make any changes to our process for capturing social media channels because we were already capturing all new posts daily as part of our business as usual work. However, we recognise that some of the content of a social media archive is going to be amongst the most interesting in the collection. For example, these videos on YouTube of the um, press conferences given early in the pandemic. We've captured over 160 million additional resources through our COVID-19 calls. Early analysis shows that about 40% of the unique resources we've captured do not exist in other open web archives collections. We've already received correspondence from users who are making use of those resources. Our team is now much more actively doing research into new tools and methods and into finding ways to put them into production quickly. We're also undertaking more analysis on the collection to guide future developments. So in conclusion, the COVID-19 collection has presented us with many challenges, but overall we're proud of the work we've done. We feel we've done our best and that the collection will be extremely useful to future researchers. Of course, it's not finished yet, and so we will continue innovating. Please go ahead and explore it using the links on the slide. And if you've got any questions, drop us an email on the um, email address. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much um, for the final presentation. If I can invite all the speakers to turn the camera on now, and we can uh, um, uh, go on to the Q&As. So um, while we're waiting for questions to come in, um, I'd just like to um, go over some of the key issues that, um, that there's one sort of running issue that I've uh, that to me has come through in all the presentations, and that's very much the one about users. So. We're not just talking about archives and um, as being uh, some resources out there, but I think you've all mentioned in the, the different interactions that users have with, uh, with your archives. So um, I wanted to go through um, so the, the various speakers and uh, I was wondering, uh, uh, Charlotte, how in, uh, in, uh, in your archives about uh, Libyan uh, resources, how do you, get users and people to interact with it, especially um, I'm thinking about the what you were describing about geolocating and the difficulty of pinning down places, uh, the, the spellings of the fact that some places are in the middle of the desert. How do you get people to help you do that? Um, I think it's really important and really difficult one of the things I've always found, it's like getting comments in a, in a meeting, uh, you know, from your colleagues. If you send around something with mistakes in it, people will correct them, especially if they're academics. Uh, whereas if you just ask them for their opinion, they don't always get back to you. Um, so that's why it seems to me very important to show what one has in the state that it's in. And people are starting to say, oh, no, that should be that that's different. But what we really want is to reach 
users in Libya. And we're only really at the very beginning of all of this. Um, and as things get a little easier, what we'd love to be doing is working with university students in Libya, for example, uh, finding, going, going and asking granny what the place was called when she was young. That kind of thing. The other group one really wants to recruit are older people, reaching them. But there are a lot of social barriers to overcome of people not feeling it's that they're entitled. And I think giving people a sense of entitlement to the use of all these resources is very, very important. And we have to be careful not to make things look too slick, actually. Mm. We have to make people feel, I could, I could add to this. I could do something. I could contribute something. Yes, I guess it's also that cultural barrier about people feeling that these kind of resources are for them as well. Yes, yes, um, yes. yes. So that you, you need a big crowdsourcing project um, about yes. getting the young people and, the, and, and older people to contribute to that. that. That's really amazing because one of my other question was to what degree the resources are, uh, you feel are more used in the UK or in Libya or indeed in other parts of the world. Um, where is it that the users come from? That's developing. That's developing. I mean, the, all of this has only been online for quite recently. The, right. the first stuff we put online in 2009 has been very widely used, um, including by lots of academics who uh, were very scornful of online academic publication. Mm -hmm. The best way to find out how something is being used is for the site to crash. <laughs> yeah, and you see how many people can play. <laughs> see what responses you've got. I found that very effective. Excellent, thank you. Um, and talking about users, um, Caroline, I was wondering in the context of discovery, obviously there's a, there's, you know, such an established resource. And if it did crash, I'm sure you'll get a lot of angry people <laughs> contacting the archives. But um, for, for, so I know it's obviously made up of uh, records of, from big archives to small archives. Um, what, what is the, how easy is it for contributors to uh, access their own record and indeed uh, add to, to the descriptions that you have? Say so if, if you have a small archive which is understaffed and maybe one full-time person and one volunteer. Yeah, we do actually have a lot of archives like that using the system. And so, but I do find that that can be a barrier um, to participation. Um, but I've found over the last couple of years working more closely with community archives that even though so um, manager collections is based on um, the international standard for archive cataloging, ISAG, and that can feel a bit intimidating at first for um, some non-professionals because we generally find that um, the sort of the stewards of, of community archives um, don't come from a professional archival background. Um, and so we run uh, training webinars and provide guidance and support um, just to sort of demystify the process a bit and just to help them feel sort of confident that, um, that they can contribute. Um, and I'd see, you know, once community archives have contributed, just how proud and happy they are that, you know, their records are online, you know, yeah. next to big local authority record offices or next to you know like TNA's own catalogue um, and that people are interested we had a community archive um, has already had some inquiries from America uh, who and they're interested in researching you know their local parish history so um, yeah it's just um, the guidance guidance and support that we can provide um, can sort of help them make that step. So Again, in the, in, in the context of discovery, um, I know that you have both UK, obviously UK archives, but um, do you also, does discovery also include international uh, archives? So, yeah, what well, Manager Collections is based on the Archon directory. So that is basically like our directory of archives. And that will be, you know, like opening times, who to contact, website details. Um, and that is broadly uh, UK based. So anyone um, with an Archon code can, um, will have a Manager Collections account if they want, if, if they want it. Uh, we do have some... Um, 
quite a lot of American archives listed in Archon, um, and that's purely because um, sort of way uh, when a lot of English manuscripts were basically sold to America. And so uh, in the NRA, we obviously index record creators. So we have a lot of, uh, for Darwin, for example, Charles Darwin, a lot of his manuscripts are in America. So we record the location of those um, and consequently have American archives um, in Archon, but it's primarily predominantly UK. Excellent, thank you. And uh, Alex, I was really intrigued by um, your, your presentation and the sort of thinking about archives that derive from archives in the, in the research process, in the, in the scholarly process. And I was just wondering, so they seem to me the fruit of something that is very personal to a researcher, um, uh, you know, the kind of things that and items that they, they choose to photograph and then to, to, to archive. Um, how, to what degree do you think that um, a personal, a researcher's personal archive might be of use to another researcher who is perhaps researching a similar area, or are these collections far too personal that um, are really only relevant and specific to that, that particular researcher? So, well, so far, I've I've only got as far as kind of what researchers are interested in gathering from the archive and they kind of keep those within those collections. So I think it's quite interesting in this because the focus is perhaps a little bit different from what the archive is doing. You get these kind of narrower emphases on what is already in the collection. So I think that those things are, would be really useful to both to other researchers, but also I think to the archive. Because I think we can sort of talk about how these um, how different meanings can be read into records, but because of the archive being having this position has to try and present just one one view through you know preserving order or, or arrangement. Whereas with users things, they start to mix this up and it starts to bring out these different contexts. So I think that kind of process of recontextualization could be potentially but very beneficial um, to other users. When it's then mixed into with other broader broader um, archives, maybe other collections or secondary sources. I'm not quite sure how the archive would incorporate that, but I think it kind of it reminds me of something um, the keynote yesterday, Oliver Atelier was talking about, which is that these are connected, but what's missing is the people. And I think it's quite interesting that users are, are doing this this work of reconnecting these, these collections, and perhaps how can the archive capitalise on that? Yes, yeah. And I wonder if in terms of sharing some of these collections, whether you're aware of tools, I mean, you, you mentioned one tool, um, but I, I, I'm not familiar with that, but I, I don't know to what extent it's the tool that is useful for the personal researcher or also for sharing uh, the collections that they might assemble. Yeah, so there's a few different things out there. I think Tropy seems to be the one that's most widely used for personal collecting and organising of materials to help that kind of research process moving from um, what the people I interviewed called the archival meaning to applying that in their own work and creating their own arguments from that. Um, but I think with these existing tools, what's quite interesting is that they are, I think you've got this divide between like finding things, which the archive sees as its responsibility, and then interpreting and using those collections, which is really left up to the user, which is why we see all of these tools that are kind of like the personal responsibility of the researcher to search out and adopt. Um, I think it'd be really interesting to see the archive kind of taking more of that responsibility on board and offering, offering these tools to researchers in-house. That's really interesting, thank you. Um, Bridget, you, you're the next one on my screen and uh, I think a lot of people will hopefully be um, familiar with open licensing and Creative Commons and the great work that, um, that Creative Commons does. Um, I was caught by a line in your, in your slides in terms of the barriers. And um, I think that's something that keeps on coming back and perhaps needs demystifying this idea that um, uh, the, the, the potential economic gain that might, uh, you know, that, that might return uh, to glam organizations from the sales of, uh, uh, of, of images and you put it in between mm. brackets. So I was wondering if you have something to, to tell us in terms of whether that is, because obviously we know that a lot of museums and galleries, they have picture libraries and, you know, they sell their 
Rastis, but you were perhaps challenging that in, the, in, in your slides. Yes, thanks for that question. Yes, um, I think this is uh, something that we need to challenge because there is evidence out there and many researchers have shown that um, the revenue that is derived from licensing uh, often does not compensate or does not um, outweigh the, the cost of uh, managing those rights. So many studies have shown that the, the salary of the person managing the licensing it often uh, outweighs the, any benefit that might be made and that uh, revening, uh, sorry, the revenue derived from licensing is often um, so low that the, it's not a profitable uh, business model for an institution. Um, Having said that, we do recognize that um, it's a huge investment to digitize and maintain uh, an online platform. So uh, there, there are ways to recoup uh, digitization and making available investment. And we're really interested in looking at what business models might be available out there um, for institutions that want to make their content freely available online. And there are some, so uh, it's, it's really interesting to see what alternatives there are. Um, we're also very interested in valuing the collections in terms of business opportunity so that the, the public can benefit from open access and uh, institutions themselves can still uh, be financially sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. That, that, that's a really interesting point about the, so looking at what the evidence is that we have to, to back up some assertions. Um, but another thing that is perhaps, again, a, a challenging uh, area with, with open licensing is when we have to do with content that might be particularly sensitive or content um, uh, from indigenous cultures or sort of sensitive heritages. So I wonder whether you have any comments on how to handle a, will we still want to advocate completely open licensing? Why not? Or, or what might be the, the issues there? Right, so I think that the, the general proposition is that we defend uh, open access, unrestricted access uh, as far as possible, but that in some cases, uh, we have to acknowledge that there are some ethical or even sometimes legal or cultural caveats that we, uh, that we need to respect. And why that arises is that often people will look at the copyright status of an object and will forget that there might be other considerations attaching to the object itself. So uh, there might be some cultural restrictions, some that derive from customary law or from customary practices, traditional practices linked to a certain object, and they might impose restrictions that are not at all reflected in the copyright system. So if an object is considered in the public domain freely, uh, available to use and reuse under copyright law, that doesn't mean that there are no other restrictions that might be ethical or, like I said, cultural. And uh, attention then arises because a, a digital image will have several ties. It will have a tie to its physical object in the institution, which might um, be belong to the institution and, and therefore there's a property title. There's also sometimes a, uh, a layer of right in the, in the digital image itself. So there might be a copyright if, for example, it's a photograph of an object, uh, the photographer might have rights in there. But there's also a stewardship or a custodianship relationship uh, between the object and the community that might still hold it as part of their living cultural heritage. And it's navigating these different ties um, that will eventually lead to a solution where uh, together with the community, the institution will be able to take action and determine whether restrictions need to be applied uh, to make content available online. Thank you. And uh, Brigitte, there's a, there's a comment and a question uh, for you coming from our audience. Um, the comment is, uh, is about the revenue, so both uh, um, are about the, the, the revenue and the economic aspect we were talking about. So um, somebody just pointing out that revenue is so small uh, in, in relative terms, is sometimes still useful to help with digitization and purchase uh, of preservation materials. So I suppose 
that uh, that's something that institutions also um, have to bear in mind. And the question it's related, so I'll read it out to you now. Um, again, in terms of <clears throat> The, the the cost of uh, institutions uh, just selling so having the service that sells the, the images um, and they're pointing out whether well, they're, they're probably assuming that institutions who do license images have done their sums so uh, there may be some institutions for whom that is fairly uh, financially still profitable. Um, I don't know if you have any more comments on uh, what you've already said. <laughs> no, and I and I I agree that this has to be uh, probably uh, examined on the case by case basis. But the evidence that uh, we have seen is that the costs far outweigh the benefits of of having such a licensing system. And I, I guess the one point that I would make is that. If your collection is not openly available, how will people know that it's there? How will these commercial opportunities arise if everything is hidden uh, between a pay behind a paywall, so to speak, and subject to a complicated licensing mechanism? Uh, the idea is to make it uh, as openly uh, accessible as possible, and then uh, with reusers, perhaps looking into some um, monetization options. Um, but I do agree that uh, the cost of making collections online is not insignificant and that uh, we have to look into more innovative um, business models to ensure that the public benefits, the institution benefits, and um, there are constant recreations and reuses of cultural heritage because that's what, uh, why one of the reasons that we, we want to preserve it is because we want to continue to build upon it and, and create more, more culture on top of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is another um, <clears throat> another comment uh, um, about um, uh, Creative Commons, but I, I think that that applies also in general to archives and the materials that we publish. So I'm going to open it up to everybody. I'm just going to read it out. Um, there are a lot of community archives where images of individuals may be shown. Those people often do not want images of themselves used everywhere, especially commercially. So people need to be more aware of the rights of people portrayed in the images, and that include children. So collections need to be aware that CC licenses cannot be revoked. So, as I said, I'm just going to throw it to all of you if, if anybody has a comment on the statement. No? Charlotte? I think it raises really interesting questions of who owns what? Do I own the image of myself? And I've often wondered whether when, if when photography first started to develop, uh, people had philosophized the relationship of a photograph to the individual in a different way. Supposing you had to have permission every time you published the photograph of an individual. Imagine what our environment, what would newspaper front pages look like? How, how, it's, it, it's, as what ifs go, it's really quite an interesting one, but, but it shows, I think, that the, the stable door, it's too late. Um, that people are, that the image of people has been turned into something that is just freely available. So when you photograph the crowd, you photograph the crowd. Yeah. Bridget, I don't know if you have any other comments from a yeah, I, I think that the situation has quite evolved in the last few years where privacy and data protection concerns online have really surfaced and have become uh, challenging for some people who uh, didn't realize at the time that they were making their content freely available under uh, a Creative Commons license and then came to realize that um, maybe uh, the terms of light of the license did not prevent uses that they had not envisaged uh, and that um, violated somehow their right to privacy. Um, but I just want to clarify that it's true that the, the Creative Commons licenses do not govern privacy or personality rights or image rights. It's solely uh, copyright that's being uh, licensed. And so any other consideration have to be made aware to anyone who would want to uh, make their content available uh, under a CC license. But um, this is 
it's an issue that's being dealt separate of the terms of the license, which, as I said, are limited to, to copyright law. Thank you. Thank you. And Caroline, you have your hand up. Um, yeah, I just wanted to add to the conversation, really, and just say that it, it is a key consideration when an archive, you know, comes to undertake a digitization project. Um, sort of what am I digitizing? You know, do I have the rights to di digitize it? And I just wanted to signpost a couple of useful resources um, if anyone needed them. Obviously, we have good guidance on um, on our website, on the National, um, the National Archives, Archive Sector Development web pages. And also the Community Archives and Heritage Group is a really great resource for any community archive out there um sort of you know if they're just starting out thinking you know I've got this really amazing collection how can we utilize it how can we you know get it out there to to more audiences then that um that group is a really useful group for sort of knowledge sharing and um has useful guidance on their website excellent thank you Caroline we've just got a couple of minutes but I do want to get to Claire because the the, the web archives are um something that always intrigued me and uh, oh, excellent. I was going to ask you, Caroline, to put something on the in the chat, but I see we've already got a link um, uh, for the resources that you've just mentioned. Um, Claire, the, uh, the, the you talked about the project um, that you've been uh, uh, involved in uh, with the web archive, and I was really intrigued by the fact that um, you have to decide when and uh, you know based on what criteria to um uh, so when to crawl uh the web and what kind of criteria to set and the the keywords for example that um that you listed there and i was just wondering how do you go about creating those criteria or the parameters that then you use to why those words and not others or what what makes you decide to go one way um as opposed to another Really, with the um, the keyword list, it was really just looking at what was being said at the time, very early in the in the um, pandemic, and we we just looked at a number of websites and looked at key phrases that kept coming up again and again. Particularly, we also used the news as well. Um, phrases that are sort of buzz phrases that are being used in in the news are quite interesting for that, and we just keep an eye on it as time goes, as, as time's gone on. Things are things have shifted we've moved at certain points it's moved the focus has moved towards work at certain points towards education and we've we've added and removed things as we can it's it's really not any more scientific it's quite manual that. it's not sort of terribly scientific uh, artificial intelligence so i'm like, so picking not, out words but <laughs> not at the moment i'm we've we've now got we're now very fortunate in that we have a, a data analyst in our team for the first time um and he's he's brilliant and um we're starting to work with him to try and look at how we can um, computerize these processes, mm. um, mainly just to make them quicker. Um, and it's been really eye-opening for our team to have somebody who who can who can who can do this sort of things. So it's really helpful. Um, but I, I can't ever see a situation where that this will ever be done completely using an AI mm. solution. I think there'll still be some kind of human being wow. curation in there to an to an extent, um, even to setting up the, the training models for it and, yeah, but, yeah but it yeah, will sure. become more more computerized as time goes on i think Excellent. and we've already actually used this the technique on another collection because when the duke of edinburgh passed away recently we were suddenly in a situation where many many government websites had a very small amount of information about the duke of edinburgh on them and we we again looked at what what the keywords were saying what his titles were um and used that exact same um, technique to, to get a, a very wide but very shallow collection of what people were saying about the, um, the death of the Duke of Edinburgh but on government websites. So it's, it's, it's quite flexible. 